I think, you know, there are other things in the diet that are important, um, and this is uh, quite, this uh, relates to what we were talking about before in terms of other ways of promoting gut bugs and why that might be important. Um, diets high in fibre, you get different gut bugs, but you also get fermentation of the fibre and you get production of short chain fatty acids, predominantly acetate and butyrate, which are then immunologically active, both in terms of blocking Th2 type allergic responses and promoting T regulatory cells and um, oral tolerance. These pathways are vitamin A dependent and there's an, a mouse model looking at this showing that if you feed mice a high fibre diet you can prevent peanut allergy and also prevent peanut allergic reactions. So, you know, this has not been looked at in humans that I know of, but it's kind of interesting. And then other dietary factors, so fish oil or supplementing with um, long chain fatty acids. There's a Cochrane analysis saying that uh, supplementation in pregnancy is associated with reduced eczema to age one and reduced allergen sensitization, reduced eczema to age three and reduced allergen sensitization to age one. Um, so with, I think what they ended up saying is there's not enough evidence to routinely suggest the use, but it's probably a healthy thing to do. There's also a couple of other things. So um, diversity, less food diversity at 12 months is associated with an increased risk of asthma, atopic ex asthma, wheeze, allergic rhinitis, and subsequently also food allergy. So eating less variety of foods is a bad thing. And there's this one from Grimshaw, published in 2014, with an infant diet high in fruits, vegetables, and food that's made at home associated with less food allergy at age two. So did, if, if you were eating fruits and vegetables mostly from packet food, actually that wasn't nearly as good as having homemade food. So it gets very complicated. Don't know why that is. And then it gets down to the question about food in particular. And I think, you know, there's no doubt what we've done about introducing foods has changed over time. I've got a copy of my neighbour's Plunkett book. Um, she's 50 this year, so what is, so 67. And at the age of five months, she, um, her mother had written that she was having a cheese souffle followed by baked apple and custard for dinner. <laughs> You'd be a very lucky five months to get that for dinner. Um, in the 1960s, the average age of solids introduction was about two months. In the 1970s, there was a guideline to delay introduction to four months, but there's at least one thing suggesting that 70% of babies were already on solids at, seven, at, four month, at three months of age in the 1970s. In the 1990s, uh, it changed to suggested delay to six months, and, I th and that's still the World Health Organization standard. And then in 2000, the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with some very strong recommendations about delaying introduction of allergens, suggesting delaying milk to one, egg to two, peanut and fish to three. And this was really a sort of a reflex response to the increasing rates of food allergy without any science behind it, but with the idea that, well, we want to stop all these kids getting allergic, so we should stop feeding them the foods that are making them allergic. Um, and of course, unfortunately, none of that worked. Increasingly, so, and a lot of it did stem back to a, a paper from the 90s where they looked at seven year follow up. And initially, there was the thought that maybe some of these food avoidance, food avoidances were making a difference. But with the seven year follow up, there wasn't any difference in atopy, eczema, food allergy, or food sensitization. And subsequently, there's a whole lot of um, population based stuff looking at timing of introduction and whether it's preventative or um, increasing risk. And so just to run through a few of those, so this is a big Israeli birth cohort of 13,000 infants. Overall, not a very high rate of IgE-mediated cow's milk allergy or CMA, um, affecting 0.05% of infants who started regular formula, formula within 14 days of life and nearly 2% of infants who started regular formula between three, 105 and 194 days. So suggesting that for the babies who were introduced to formula early, they were mostly tolerant of it, as opposed to increasing their chances of being allergic to it. There's a few more things that do the same thing. So George Dutoy and Guinea and Lack re recognised that they'd 
very high rates of peanut allergy in London at the same time that Jewish kids in Israel had very low rates of peanut allergy and they've got this curious snack thing called a bamba which is this puffed corn that's impregnated with peanut which dissolves on contact with saliva and, and it's introduced really early in, as a routine such that 40% of six month old infants are already eating bamba which means they're already eating peanut. So it was this curious idea about why the rate of peanut allergy in Jewish kids in London was maybe 1-2% to 2 and almost unheard of in Israel. Um, this one with egg also came out of um, health nuts and I'll, I've got some more information from that on the next slide. There's also one looking at wheat where the, there was a lower rate of wheat allergy introducing wheat at under six months compared with over seven months of age. So there's all these sort of population based stuff suggesting that maybe it's a good thing. This is the health nuts data broken down, chance of egg allergy by timing, and they divided it up into high risk if there was either a family history or the child already had a food allergic reaction or the child had eczema. So with low risk kids who had none of those risk factors, even for them, um, the, the rate of egg allergy, 1.4% introduced between four and six months up to four and a half percent introduced at 10 to 12 months. But for the high risk kids, the rate of egg allergy introduced at four to six months was 12% and the rate of egg allergy if egg wasn't introduced until over a year was 39%. So this is not an intervention study, this is just observation, but it does raise the question again. And with all of this then, what there have been is a whole lot of, of intervention studies. And so LEAP was published in 2015 and what they did, they, so they recruited um, 600 odd kids who either had what they defined as severe eczema or they'd already had an egg allergic reaction. And on enrolment they skin tested them to peanut. And if your peanut skin test was four millimetres or less, then you could be recruited. So the kids with five millimetre or bigger skin tests, they said, well, you're probably peanut allergic, so we won't study you. At randomisation, they were then challenged with peanut. And for those that were tolerant, they were advised to carry on eating peanut at a rate of two grams a couple of times a week regularly until the age of five. And then at five, they did another challenge to determine whether or not they were allergic. And so of those who were skin test negative, so this is primary prevention. Can you stop sensitisation in kids who are skin test negative? The rate of peanut allergy in the avoidance group was 13% and the rate in the consumption group was 2%. So you couldn't stop all kids becoming peanut allergic, even by getting them to eat it early. Some of them still developed peanut allergy. But in the kids who were skin test positive, the, the, the difference is even bigger. So that if you're skin test positive at the age of four to 10 months and you avoid peanut until the age of five, your risk of peanut allergy is about 35%. Whereas if you can start eating it, and of course not everybody could, but if you can start eating it, your rate's about 10%. So this is secondary prevention. This is sensitized early introduction, regular eating. And the other thing, and so overall that's obviously a, an enormously different rate of peanut allergy in these kids. The <coughs> other thing that I haven't got on the slide, but they recruited, they initially were going to start recruiting between six months and ten months, and then they dropped the recruitment age to four months. And the reason they did that is they found quite a high number of kids who already had a skin test of more than four millimetres. And so they dropped it so that they could recruit the numbers that they wanted into the study. So your chance of having a skin test big enough that you couldn't be recruited increased with age. So it wasn't even across that. If you were 10 months, you had a bigger chance of not getting into the study in the first place. Does that make sense? With that, there's a number of different ones. The same group then did the, something called the EAT study, and this was um, taking a large number of kids and they were recruiting at three months of age, and the aim was to introduce everything. Well, you know, everything in terms of common allergy. So peanut, cooked egg, milk, sesame, fish, and wheat from three months of age. And actually what they found was that it was very difficult for anybody to comply with the protocol because a lot of these babies didn't actually want to eat all of those things twice a week. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a little bit busy, but they've broken it down by intention to treat. That means uh, what was the outcome comparing standard introduction to early introduction. But per protocol, it means that they've broken it down by the people who could actually get their baby to do this. 
and adjust it as controlling for other risk factors. So overall, the chance of having one or more food allergies wasn't actually that different in the, in the intention to treat analysis. But once you broke it down to those who actually could achieve it, the rate of food allergy to one or more foods was significantly less than those who could introduce foods. And then this next line is peanut. And again, so standard introduction, uh, they ended up with about 2.5% of this not risky population. That's not what I meant to say, but so these were just, these were not high risk populations, this was a normal population. 2.5% of them with peanut allergy. Compared to early introduction, 300 babies introduced to peanut at three months of age, none of whom are peanut allergic. Um, and this is the egg data. So per protocol, 5% of them allergic with standard introduction down to 1.4% with early introduction. So what I think it says is that it's difficult to make babies eat stuff they don't want to eat, but if you can get them eating stuff early, then that for these particular food allergens, that's useful. Yeah. So as a GP, I've got a mum coming in and she says, my older sibling's got eczema and a peanut allergy, and now I'm thinking about something my three-month-old's followers. Can we give them that advice that you'll... You know, like you've got one, one sibling who's got the atopic and this baby hasn't started solids yet, so can they then... So this is, to my knowledge, the only study that's gone down to three months of age. And obviously three months is pretty hard, because I think developmentally a lot of three-monthers are not ready for science. Yeah, but if they look like they're ready and they can hold the head up and they think it's good, or even four months, they can yeah. start And this. so look, I, I, I guess I'm saying not before four months, probably because I'm sitting on the fence and this is one study and, you know. Um, and, and because I can say, you know, the New Zealand guidelines are at around six months of age, and I think that four months is around six months, loosely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it is... OK, so even at the four months, they can, if they've got yeah. siblings highly atopic, they're the ones who should absolutely be absolutely. having. Yeah. yeah, and there's no reason not yet. Just small amounts mixed in with a puree or something. Yeah, I mean, peanut and banana is quite nice, actually. <laughs> Um, this is a, another egg one, so this is a Japanese one, uh, two-step using egg powder, um, but the same thing basically. So this is primary prevention with three out of 11 in the placebo group, none out of 15 in the egg group allergic, and the sensitised group again, almost half of those who were sensitised were allergic by the age of one, compared to 7% who could actually start eating egg early. So a positive skin test shouldn't stop us from early introduction. Is there a lot of allergy in Japan? Yeah. Yeah, there is. Um, and look, the, I don't. The Japanese, uh, there's not. They haven't published a lot of their stuff, but you go to meetings and they've got. Um, they're doing an enormous amount of food desensitisation, which they haven't published yet. But and and I've patients who go there to start their desensitisation and come back and give me these sheets of paper in Japanese saying what they're meant to be doing and I smile and wave and, you know, yeah. So there's a lot. And across dairy. Yeah, a lot of wheat. They get a lot of buckwheat actually, because soba noodles. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, so just sort of clinically, you've got the non-sensitised group and then the sensitised group. Sensitised group have had their skin testing, whereas generally you didn't perhaps we're not going to record yeah. that. I think <laughs> that makes it much easier. Um, but so just going back to sort of practical advice is just introduce it early. Yeah. Even if they've got a high risk, a sibling, they usually high risk. What about and they've got eczema? Yeah. Um, I think it comes down to it depends <laughs> because I, I think there's a difference between. Um, eczema that you know sometimes people come to see you because they're really really worried about eczema and you kind of feel like you need a bit of a magnifying glass and it's not actually that bad but if you've got a bright red top to toe weepy awful eczema then the chance of that baby also having food allergy is probably in the order of 40 to 60 percent so you know I, I'm much more circumspect about just give it a bash if if they've really got very difficult eczema. That doesn't mean I would necessarily um, not introduce foods, but I'm gonna spend a bit more time talking to them about how to do that. You know, not on a Sunday night <laughs> at the beach, you know. Yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of that goes on.
So, John, we often times when we were like suggesting for people to try to clean up, so you could say put a bit on the skin, mm. don't do that. Don't do that, no. no. Because um, what's the point? You know, some of these babies are going to have a positive skin test. Yeah. And I don't want to know that. No. I want to know if you can eat it. Yeah. Day, yeah. yeah. And also, I think the trouble is, if you put it on the skin, you've got, you know, and you get irritation from it, then. You're not sure. You know? Yeah. yeah. It makes it, I think you're just muddying the waters. Yeah. Mm. Um, just out of, I mean, this is, these are some of the other studies that are being done. I think all of these are egg. Um, basically, essentially showing very much the same thing. But you'll notice at the top, the, this study looking at infants with moderate to severe eczema, starting with raw whole egg powder, IgE mediated allergy at 12 months. But in fact, um, they had anaphylaxis on first dose at challenge in the study. So um, we do need to be a little bit cautious about telling people what to do, particularly in babies who, for whatever reason, we think are at, at higher risk. And I think this one was uh, also, so it's a, a um, German one with significant anaphylaxis rate at, at introduction. So could we tell those people to maybe put a tiny bit of cookie in with a big batch of puree? Yeah. And so they get a tiny bit over yeah. time, like rather than giving them scrambled eggs or toasted. Exactly. Yeah. On a day when you're at home and the baby's well, because uh, other intercurrent infections sort of compound the chance of significant reactions. When you've got, you haven't got a list of a hundred things you're trying to do, and you know you've got access to care. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of <laughs> it gets done. So I saw a woman recently who was a self-declared. Um, uh, she was from South America and she said she was quite <coughs> South American in her approach to life. And um, the baby had had a reaction to cow's milk and everyone told her, oh no, that's okay, you should just introduce everything else. And so she introduced the egg and peanut in the um, emergency department waiting room at North Shore. And she said, and promptly presented with the egg and peanut allergic reactions. And she said they were uh, uh, getting increasingly sceptical when it, they said, how long ago did you try the peanut? And it was, oh, 35 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, what do we say? I think dietary inclusion of allergenic foods and it seems to reduce the chance of food allergy. It doesn't prevent food allergy, it reduces the chance. There's definitely no benefit to avoidance. Dietary diversity is probably good. Preserving a skin barrier, Diane has already talked about. The microbiome is likely to be really important and is potentially a modifiable thing. Um, Breastfeeding should be encouraged, but is not going to be preventative. And and I think the other key thing is that, you know, what I'm saying is only briefly true. And it, you know, the advice is going to change, and it constantly does. <laughs> so, for those of you who haven't used the ASCIA guidelines, it's allergy.org.au, and so it's the Australasian Society of Clinical Immunology and Allergy. And there's been quite a lot of recent work about revising the infant feeding and allergy prevention guidelines. And part of this has been driven because the Americans and the British have taken the LEAP study results and developed a strategy for peanut, of prevention, peanut allergy prevention, which centres around testing. And so for, the, for those at no risk, then you just introduce peanut. But if you've either got a bit of eczema or you've had food allergy, then you screen with a skin test and then challenge. And so within Australasia, there's a fair amount of, um, well, I, I think everyone doesn't actually agree with that as a strategy because, because skin prick testing is not a very good screen if you look at sort of screening criteria. And what we run the risk of is if you screen patients and they have a positive skin test, then the wait time to get a challenge might be months, by which stage you've significantly increased your risk of being allergic. So it kind of doesn't make any sense. What the infant feeding guidelines say are recommend a healthy, balanced diet, rich in fibre, fruits and vegetables. Um, excluding, the mother shouldn't eat any foods that she's highly allergic to. <laughs> <laughs> Um, three serves of oily fish a week may help prevent eczema and 
in early life, and that probiotics may be useful, but we don't really know what the best specific recommendations might be. So that's maternal diet during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Breastfeeding and infant formula. So breastfeeding is recommended, obviously. Um, breastfeeding through the, parent, through the period where solids are introduced may be useful, although there's not really good data to prove that at the moment. And if breastfeeding is not possible, then we should go straight to a standard cow's milk formula. And look, you often see quite a lot of anxiety about that, particularly if you've got a previously affected infant. But I think that families do get the notion of tolerance. And so if you can say, look, the best way of stopping your second child from getting the cow's milk allergy is actually starting some cow's milk when you need to do that, that that's fine. And we don't, uh, so the previously labelled HA or partially hydrolyzed formulas are not now suggested. Um, and that in terms of choosing a formula, there's no, uh, there's no advantage in using a different sort of uh, infant formula in terms of goat's milk, um, soy milk or any of the others, and they're not recommended in infants anyway. Introducing foods, um, and so the wording that ASCII's ended up with is that at around six months, but not before four, to introduce foods, thinking about doing it one at a time, continue the foods regularly, and thinking about texture, which is probably more important than exactly which foods you're introducing. And specifically with respect to egg and peanut, it just runs through why we want to get these things in early. Um, and has got a suggestion about doing, uh, you know, how you might go about doing that. So mushing up hard-boiled egg, or um, using a bit of peanut butter mixed with other foods. Um, not smearing it on the skin, but you can put a little bit on the inside of the lip if you want, and I'd normally just say have a taste off your finger, which is essentially doing the same thing. Um, and then I think particularly where you think there's a significant chance of somebody having a, a food allergic reaction, which is normally because there is a family history or because they've got some eczema, making sure that people have a vague idea about what they're looking out for and what to do. Because I think if we can empower people to do this, they also need to know what to do in the situation that it doesn't go according to plan. So these are on the ASCIA website. They are downloadable and printable in quite an accessible form, I think. And I think, uh, the, you know, I'll come back to testing in the last session. And it's not that I would never test, because I think for some families they're just paralysed with the idea of having to manage a food allergic reaction. Um, the other thing that we do in clinic quite a lot now is if somebody's coming in because they've had a significant allergic reaction to milk or egg, we just give them some peanut butter in clinic while they're there. Um, and with about a 50-50 hit rate, which is not bad, I think. Yeah. So you might, I'm not sure if you guys are going to be touching on this, because what about the mum that comes in with her kid coming in next and says, oh, I'm, I want to try and see if cow's milk's making it worse, I put them on soy, what, like can, can they do that to see if it makes a difference, and, or is it just... I think um, families often want to know, is the, food, is the eczema caused by food allergy, and the way I try and reframe it is that actually eczema is not caused by food allergy. Food allergy is probably caused by eczema. And you've got to treat the skin and clear the skin. And then it's much easier to see if there's a food allergic reaction. And they say, oh, I don't want to use steroids, I just want to change the formula. It's like, well, you've got to use steroids and get the skin looking lovely and then we can think about food. And by then, of course, they don't need to because the skin's looking lovely and it's much easier. Um, and I, I think taking a food out of the diet, if it's already tolerated, is fraught. Because if you are tolerant to something, you can lose tolerance. Mm. And there's one hideous case in the literature of a four-year-old who had milk taken out of her diet because of bad eczema. And the eczema didn't get better, but no one thought to put the milk back. And with time, she started having allergic reactions to milk, and she died of milk anaphylaxis at the age of 16. Mm. And on this one case, and it, I mean, I'm sure it doesn't happen often, I have done it years ago to a kid who was eating fish um, and who had quite a big skin test to fish, and at the time the kind of, he had awful skin, and we took fish out of his diet but forgot to put it back and can't put it back because he's fish allergic now. So, and that I, you don't want to interrupt tolerance. 
especially in little kids. So those under ones where they're switched, they, yeah, and you've got that in those guidelines, that they're soy, eat, goat. Yeah, if you're already eating it, keep on eating it. Do you, I mean, generally, families, like, when they take all of these with their child, and you just have to sell it to them on the way to the future, but rather than the immediate next for now, you're interested in the child's well-being and what they're going to eat in the school. So even if the eczema came on at the time you introduced the cow's milk formula, it's... I think eczema as the sole manifestation of a food allergic reaction is really unlikely. Yeah. There are some studies looking, not great studies, I would say, they're looking at removing dairy or treating eczema, so they had dairy cows and they had a group of them stayed on cow's milk and a group went on to medicate And look, obviously we also see a lot of patients who have bad eczema and food allergy. Because the two go together. It's just it's not causal. The other scenario I see is where the kid's skin's been fine until like they're seven or eight months and suddenly they get eczema. So the parent's first thought is, oh, it must be something I've introduced. Because why have they just got the eczema now? And I've got no risk factors, so I don't really know what to say to them then. Like, why have they been fine before? Is it just, like, we don't know. Why does it have to be food? Right, okay. Like it's just they've got a genetic predisposition to eat. Genetic predisposition. Some environmental trigger. I mean, they may have put something different in the bath. Yeah. Well, could it be a virus? Like, can you get a bad... They could have a bit of a virus that irritates. I mean, we don't know, but people are very food focused. Yeah. Probably a misdirected focus. Okay. Very food focused. I get that. Yeah. I just wanted a bit of a minefield set. Yeah. And because it's not just eczema that people are food focused. I mean, it's the early crying baby stuff is yeah. all very food focused. Oh yeah, it must be something I've, I ate, I had a coffee or I had something or yeah. I had a curry last night, that's why the baby's crying. Mm. Mm. Yeah. What if the, uh, the eczema is also related to um, with other signs that's You know, IgE mediated food allergic reactions tend to happen closely in association with the thing. And so, yeah, you can get vomiting and diarrhoea with a food allergic reaction, but the onset of that is normally closely associated with exposure to that food allergen, rather than the sort of vomity baby who's vomity all the time, where, you know, you take one thing out and then you take another thing out, and before you know it, you're avoiding 10 things and they're still vomity. Yeah. 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 It's easy to understand early introduction of food will prevent allergic reaction as they get older as uh, shown in Israel, uh, but the problem is how do you manage if the infant has mild, moderate or severe allergy or eczema or uh, yeah. when will you think of introducing food and that's where the controversy. And look I think if, you, if you've got severe eczema probably the answer is early is better than late but um, doing that safely is the key. And, you know, normally I'm seeing them because they've already had one food allergic reaction and then we, we can discuss the pros and cons of testing other things or just trying other things. Um, but ideally, trying them is probably the best way to know. Yeah. I'm just wondering if it's the incidence of food allergies increasing. Where does that, there's a trend that the duration is also increasing? Yeah. That children aren't out, outgrowing allergies they used to have? Yeah, so when I trained, the teaching at the time was that most milk and egg went away by three or four. Yeah. Whereas it's clear that that's now not the case. And we see a lot of kids with persistent food allergies into teenage years, including things like milk and egg and wheat, that historically we thought went away really early. Why that is, we don't know. But I mean, I think the concept is still the same, that we've disrupted immune regulation and we've lost tolerance, we've lost 
the functioning of regulatory T cells for whatever. Probably a combination of reasons. And possibly elimination diet, like you say. Mm. Well, I think you know, removing allergen altogether until. Well, possibly, especially for milk and egg, because of the stuff, the stuff, you know, about, you know, if you've got a threshold of tolerance, then maybe eating it to that threshold is a reasonable thing to do. But I think with peanut and nut, there's never really been much threshold of tolerance, so, yeah. Sorry, I've got this edge on the and only bits of facial rest on eating So far, I've tried to keep them going with eating the egg. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good question. And we come across that at Food Challenge all the time. That, you know, is, is this a reaction or is it irritant or what? And um, I think if it's not that bad, I keep going, you know. And, and I think lots of things will give you a bit of perioral erythema with foods, especially in, you know, babies who are using every food substance as a skincare product. And, <laughs> If there will be eczema, would that theory be creating the risk of developing that? If you smear it throughout your... Yes, yeah, so if you're getting a lot of irritant local reactions, I just talk to people about using a bit of barrier beforehand and keeping going. Yeah. On, on that same note, what about the case where you get a, an eight-month-old whose mum's given them egg for the first time and they come out in hives, but there's nothing else to see by the time you see them? Um, and she shows you a photo and you can see that it's got hives. What's your... like? Do you do a rice test then, or what's your advice? Well, if they're probably egg allergic, then uh, then I'd think about testing it. Yeah. But I can't give my entire afternoon talk before lunch, because then what will we do? <laughs> 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 mm. We've got um, 10 minutes still, so if anyone's got yeah. any other burning questions. Oh, they can have an hour and 10 minutes for um, lunch. <laughs> <laughs> this one down. This. Yeah, I mean, it just it's seeming to me that from what you're saying, from the science at, at least, um, and with your clinical experience, that the relationship between the gut and food allergy and, and eczema is really unclear at this point. Because I mean, it, it seems, I mean, you're you're saying that maybe food allergies are not causative for eczema in general. And that's kind of the conclusion you guys are drawing. But we're seeing that there are some benefits for, for example, um, fiber in the diet, you know, helping with the small chain fatty acid fermentation, which helps to improve gut health, and that helps to decrease food allergies. Yeah. So, um, you know, and then also probiotics. We don't have it figured out yet, but there's some weak evidence that it helps to prevent uh, eczema when it's taken perinatally. So, I mean, there's some evidence showing that they're... That oh, I'm sure your gut's really important. Yeah. I think, but I think it's about um, how do you promote good microbiota, like the, the right bugs. And, and, and it may be that just feeding the bugs is not as important as, you know, essentially fibre is a prebiotic. It's providing the right food for the right bugs. Yeah. And, and vitamin D may be the same, and vitamin A probably has an effect in that way. And, and I think this might be where that idea about Eating a diet full of real food is actually important. Yeah. You know. So, so through the morning, we, you mentioned wheat a few times, but the word gluten hasn't been mentioned at all. No, that's because um, I'm going to focus on IgE allergy. Right, so that's the. Right, yeah, that rather than diet. celiac, yeah. yeah. Yeah, sort of gluten intolerance, which is different. Oh, interesting, there is stuff about, I mean, I don't know that I'm not a gastroenterologist, but there is stuff about. Uh, tolerance to gluten in terms of age of introduction, amount of introduction, and in the context of breastfeeding, where not too much, not too little, at about the right time while you're still breastfeeding may actually be tolerogenic for gluten as well. Is there an increased risk of celiacs with food, with like multiple food allergies? I don't think so. Um, I mean, I would see a smattering of kids who've got both, but not many, and celiacs really common now as well. Mm. Sorry, just, just going back a step, the um, six-month guidelines for breastfeeding, do, do you know why that has persisted? Um, sort of established in the 90s and never really been well, I think, challenged? 
from the New Zealand Ministry point of view, that's still in alignment with the World Health Organization point of view, which is in alignment with what's best for the world. But your risk of allergy in New Zealand is probably greater than your risk of waterborne disease. So, you know, it's it's different uh, priorities. However, saying that, I mean, there's, there is evidence that breastfeeding protects against type 2 diabetes and uh, obesity, isn't that? So, you know, breastfeeding in the longer protect, is more protective against other long term conditions. I think a lot of people will be reading that in terms of exclusive breastfeeding That's versus, right. mm -hmm. um, really and even when, when, when you talk to patients about weaning they read that as weaning off breastfeeding as, as opposed to weaning onto solids. Mm. So sort of... Sort of introduction of complementary foods while breastfeeding and the right age for that. saying don't breastfeed for six months or greater or a year or two years, whatever. Yeah. What we're saying is when we're introducing... Eat some other stuff as well. Mm.